Today on Answers with Bayless Conley. If you've lost your fire, if you've lost your passion, then draw near to God and He will draw near to you. There are many questions you are faced with every day. We are all searching for answers that will make a real difference in our lives. It's hard to imagine that these answers might be right in front of us. Get ready to discover answers in the Bible with Bayless Conley. Hello friend, welcome to the broadcast today. I've got some exciting things to be sharing with you and, and some things that I think will provoke you to think. Have you ever wondered, how can I gauge my spiritual growth? How can I determine where I'm at with God? Well, we can find answers for that in the scripture. We're gonna deal with three specific things, three ways that we can gauge our growth with God. The first one is our speech. Let's get into that message right now. I want to speak to you tonight about three easy tests to gauge our spiritual growth. You know, under the old covenant, God's people were encouraged to test themselves and examine themselves. Lamentation chapter 3, verse 40, it says, Let us search out and examine our ways and turn back to the Lord. In the New Testament, as well as believers, we're encouraged to examine ourselves. I read to you 2 Corinthians 13 and verse 5, and I want to read it from the Message Bible. It says, test yourselves to make sure you are solid in the faith. Don't drift along taking everything for granted. Give yourselves regular checkups. You need firsthand evidence, not mere hearsay, that Jesus Christ is in you. Test it out. If you fail the test, do something about it. You know, just a, a couple of days ago, Janet was concerned that the oil in her car was low, so I taught her how to check her oil. She didn't know. You know, you pop the hood, for those of you watching internationally, you pop the bonnet on your car or your truck, and there's a thing called a dipstick. You pull it out, it's quite long, you wipe it off, put it back in, pull it out, and it will tell you the level of oil, tell you if it's filled to maximum, if it's low, if it's dry. And you know, there's, there are certain tests that we can do to let us know our level with God, how deep we are with God, if you would. In fact, the Holy Spirit's work in our life, you know, by way of analogy, is referred to as oil, anointing oil. You can check the Holy Spirit oil. There's a gauge or a few gauges that you can do it with. So I want to share with you three ways to examine ourselves to see how solid we are in the faith how close to or distant from God we might be. Are you ready? Are you sure? All right, test number one is our speech. You know, after his arrest in Matthew chapter 26, Jesus is being spit upon and beaten. Meanwhile, Peter is in the courtyard at a distance and a young girl comes up to him and said, you are with Jesus of Galilee. And Peter said, I don't know what you're talking about. A few minutes later, a different girl comes up, says, you, or, or, or talk to some guys. This guy is one of those that was with Jesus of Nazareth. And Peter swears, I don't know what you're talking about. I don't know the guy. And then some people came up to him and said, surely you're one of his disciples for your speech betrayed you. Now, of course, they were talking about his Galilean accent, but there's a great truth here in general. Our speech always betrays us, whether we are one of Christ's disciples or not. You just have to listen to someone talk to know if they're a disciple of Christ or if they are not. Look with me at Luke's gospel, the sixth chapter, if you would. Luke chapter 6, and we want to pick it up in verse 43. Jesus said, for a good tree, 
does not bear bad fruit, nor does a bad tree bear good fruit. For every tree is known by its own fruit. For men do not gather figs from thorns, nor do they gather grapes from a bramble bush. A good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth good, and an evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart brings forth evil. For out of the abundance of the heart, his mouth speaks. Out of the abundance of his heart, his mouth speaks. That's true of every one of us. Out of the abundance of our heart, our mouth speaks. If something is important to us, if something truly fills our heart, we will talk about it. Whether it's sports or cars or gardening or food or the latest video game or God. What we love, we talk about it. It is an inescapable truth. You know, I had a friend one time, I was spending the day with him, and he turns to me and says, have I told you about not my new grandchild yet? And I thought, you know, only about six times <laughs> in the last two hours. Please, and I remember making a mental note to myself, if I ever become a grandfather, I will never be that kind of a grandfather. I will never drone on and on about my grandkids and tell people about them that are not interested. But you have to realize I, I made that decision before I knew how exceptional <laughs> my grandchildren would be. I had no idea they would be so beautiful and so above average. So I, I never would have said that had I known. I can tell you about which one is athletic, what they like to eat. I can tell you stories you don't want to hear. I can tell you about how Sawyer is, is, is an outdoors, crazy, tree-climbing kid and, and tell you stories that, like I said, you don't want to hear. But it's easy for me to talk about them because they fill yeah. my heart. Yeah. I talk about them easily because I love them. You listen to some people and then go on and on about golf. I'm one of those guys. I can do that. I can tell you, the last game of golf I played, I can tell you my score. I can tell you every club I used, every shot I used on every hole. I can tell you how far I hit the ball on every shot. I can tell you what I was thinking when I swung the club all 18 holes. I can tell you every putt I made. In fact, let, let's go, all right? <laughs> hole, number, hole number nine. I hit an errant drive, about 230 yards. I hit it right under the trees. I was handcuffed. You have to hit over water. It's a par five for your second shot, and I can't get over the water. So I'm thinking about punching it underneath, but I saw a window up above. So I took my 58-degree wedge, and I hit it. Perfect shot, about 80, 85 yards right through the window, stopped short of the water. Then I hit my rescue club. I hit it to 100 yards from the green. The flag was in the back right-hand side of the green on an upper tier. So I took my 52-degree wedge. You, you need to know that. <laughs> And I hit it to about eight feet up on that upper tier. And I thought, all right, I've still got a chance at par, but the putt leaked right, and I missed the putt, ended up with a bogey. I can tell you about hole number two, hole number seven, hole number 10, hole number 12, and I can go back a lot of rounds before that. Why? I happen to like golf. Are there any golfers in the house who know what I'm talking about? Amen. Yeah, of course. Listen to this verse. It's Malachi 3.16, and this is from the Living Bible. It'll be on the screen. It says, then those who feared and loved the Lord spoke often of him to each other. And he had a book of remembrance drawn up in which he recorded the names of those who feared him and loved to think about him. There is a book in heaven where God records the names of those that speak about him often. Is your name in heaven? that book. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 12 that we will give an account for every idle or non-productive non word that we speak in the day of judgment. Think about that. I'll give an account for every idle word that I speak. He went on to say, by your words you're justified. By your words you'll be condemned. Let me ask you a question. Is your speech full of doubt, fear, pessimism, or is it filled with hope? 
faith and encouragement. Do people leave your presence after they, they've been with you and listened to you? Do they leave your presence lifted up or weighed down? Now some people say, well, look, I just believe in being honest. If things feel dark or things look dark, I'll say so. When my circumstances change, then I'll change my speech. No, you need to learn to change your speech if you want your circumstances to change. Start talking to your mountain about how big your God is rather than continually talking to God and everyone else about how big your mountain is. Learn to shout while Jericho's walls are still standing. Learn to say, Father, I thank you that you've heard me while your Lazarus is still in the tomb. Yes, we need to be honest, but listen to me. People that are close to God are people of faith, and faith always affects our speech. I have an acquaintance. He had a friend visiting. They were both believers, and this friend of his just went on and on and on about, you know, the dark side of everything and how, you know, it's this bad thing was going to happen and, oh, he's worried about this and just, like, supercharged the atmosphere with unbelief and just went on and on. And my friend, you know, tried to, to, to help him, said, look, you know, why don't you just speak a little more positively about things? You know, you could put God's word in your mouth just as easily as you can talk about, you know, the, the dark things of life. And the guy said, well, if you had my circumstances, you'd talk just like I would. And this, this friend slash acquaintance of mine said, look, I wouldn't normally do this, but I'm going to try and help you. Let me tell you about what's going on in my life right now. And he began to talk about his own problems and his own challenges. And they were far more severe than this guy that was complaining. And the guy said, I don't understand. How can you have such peace and how can you be so positive with those kind of things going on in your life? And he simply said to him, because I believe what God's word has said about my circumstances. If you are close to God, you will be in faith. And if you're in faith, it'll come out in your speech. Your speech my speech, it always betrays us. It always shows where we're at with God. All right, secondly, look with me at 1 John chapter 4, if you would. Test number two is how we treat others. Always reveals where we're at with God. How we treat others. 1 John chapter 4 and verse 7. Beloved, let us love one another. For love is of God, and everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. He who does not love does not know God, for God is love. Now, won't you look up here? It says, we need to love one another, for everyone who loves is born of God and knows God. He who does not love does not know God. I think it's possible to be born of God. But if you live a selfish life and you don't put others first and you're not really loving people, you don't know. You're, you're, you're not in the, the, the space of having an intimate relationship with God. The love we express to others, how we treat others, always is a revelation of where we are in our relationship with our Creator. Look in verse 20, this same chapter. It says, if someone says, I love God and hates his brother... He's a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen, how can he love God whom he's not seen? And this commandment we have from him, that he who loves God must love his brother also. Look back at Matthew chapter 5, very well-known section of Scripture. Matthew chapter 5 and verse 43. Jesus said, You've heard that it was said, You shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies. Bless those who curse you. Do good to those who hate you. And pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. That you may be the sons of your Father in heaven. For he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good. And sends rain on the just and on the unjust. So part of this test is not just how we 
treat our brothers and sisters in the Lord. It's how we treat our antagonists and our enemies and our persecutors and those that hate us. You know, there was a lady that I knew when I first got saved. She had a couple little kids, and she was living in the top floor of a duplex. And uh, the owner decided that he was going to break the contract and kick her out. She, she had a lease uh, agreement with him. And, and, you know, looking back, I think it was just the fact that housing went up and rents went up, and he thought, man, I can get a lot more money then I'm getting with her, but the only way, I've got to break this contract, get her out. I'll get somebody in that can pay a lot more rent. And uh, so he couldn't legally, legally put her out, so he made up a bunch of stuff. And I, I knew the situation. He actually made up several lies, went to the authorities and told them that, that X, Y, Z had happened. They were destroying the property and, and on and on. And so he got whatever paperwork he needed to evict her from this duplex, this lady and her kids. And I remember she got in touch with me the day before they had to be gone. She said, can you come over and help us? I said, sure. And I went there and she said, we want to clean the place, the place out. We want to just, just make it spotless. So we spent the entire night vacuuming floors. I remember this lady even went into the closets and she scrubbed the inside of the closets made the place so clean you'd think Jesus was going to be moving in. And the guy actually came over while we were cleaning the place. He thought we were probably in, you know, stealing the refrigerator or something. And he bursts into the door and he's about to holler. And he looks around and realizes what's being done. I'll never forget it. He looked at this lady and he said, why? After what I've done to you, why would you do this for me? You know what she said? She said, because God loves you, and I'm praying for your soul. He looked like somebody had thrown a wet mackerel in his face. He was absolutely stunned. Look at Matthew chapter 6. There's one final test I want to share with you, and it's this. Our giving always is a test of where we are in our relationship with God. Matthew chapter 6 and verse 19, Jesus said, Do not lay up for yourself treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys, where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart is will be also. Isn't that beautiful? Where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. What we love, we invest in. Our time, our treasure, our talent, what we love, we invest in. And I think there's a, a, a brilliant example of this in the book of Hebrews, the 11th chapter. It, it speaks about the first two children that Adam and Eve had, Cain and Abel. In particular, I want to read you verse 4, Hebrews 11 and verse 4. By faith, Abel offered to God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, through which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and through it, he being dead, still speaks. Now, by faith, Abel gave a more excellent, that literally means a better quality sacrifice than his brother Cain, a better quality offering. And his gift that he gave to God, it says it testified that he was righteous. And righteous just means to have a right relationship with God. So Abel's gift to God testified that he had a right relationship with God. It bore witness of where his relationship with God was It demonstrated his faith in God and his love for God, as is equally true for each and every one of us. You can read the story if you want. It's found in Genesis chapter 4, verses 1 through 7. And it says, you know, when the harvest time came, both Cain and Abel brought gifts to God. Now, Cain was a tiller of the ground. He was a farmer. Abel was a keeper of sheep. Both, you know, great occupations. And gifts of the fruit of the ground, completely acceptable to God. 
just like, you know, the, the, the uh, gift from the flocks were acceptable. But it, it talks about Cain, the gift that he brought is just nondescript. Cain brought an offering that didn't cost him anything. There was nothing special about it. But the scripture specifically says, when Abel brought his gift to God, he gave God his first and he gave God his best. And God respected Abel and accepted his offering, but he did not respect Cain and his offering. And Cain became angry and his countenance fell. And God said, Cain, what's up? Why are you so angry? If you do well, if you do what's right, you'll also be accepted. But if you don't, sin is crouching at the door and it wants to master you. You see, Cain's lukewarm gift revealed his lukewarm relationship. Abel, however, gave his first and his best because God was first and most important in his life. And it all boiled down to this. It was a revelation of their relationship. I have a friend, pastors a fairly large church, and I, I think a significant church because they, they do their best to feed the flock and they're, they're soul winners. And he did something he'd never done before. He decided to check the giving record of, of all of the employees. He'd never done it after having had the church for years and years. So he did, and, and he said he was really surprised to find out that one of his main leaders, in fact, the guy that had the second highest salary of any employee on the whole team, he and his wife had not given not even one cent to the church in over a year. So he went to him and just was honest and said, look, I checked the giving records and, and it doesn't show that you and your wife have given anything. He said, do you, do, you just, do you give in cash and just do it anonymously? The guy said, no, we don't do that. He said, well, are you guys in a financial bind? He said, no, we're doing great financially. He said, well, well why? You know, we, we teach tithing. We, we teach, you know, honoring God with the first part of your, your income. The scriptures, Old and New Testament, teach it. Don't you believe it? He said, yeah, we believe it. And it turns out his wife had gotten offended at somebody and said, well, we, we just didn't want to give because my wife was kind of bent out of shape. And so the pastor and him, you know, they had a conversation. said, look, you know, you, you need to start doing this because there's more involved. And if you think about it, it's just wrong on so many levels. There are single mothers in our church. There's single mothers that honor God with the first part of their income, even though it's a great sacrifice for them. They do it out of obedience. They do it in faith. They do it because they love Christ and they love the house. We have elderly people, listen to me, on fixed incomes. And the first thing they do when they get their social security check or whatever income they have, the first thing they do is they honor God with the first and the best. And then you've got somebody that actually has the privilege of earning a living from that, and they're not even tithing themselves. It's just so wrong. So the pastor said, look, you know, this has got to change. He said, I will, pastor. I realize, you know, I've been wrong, and, and we're, we're going to start tithing. Well, pastor let it go six months, and he said he checked it again after six months, and they had not given one thin dime in the next six months. He went to him again, and, and this time, well, it's somebody else's fault. Somebody did this to me, and we were just mad. And, and the pastor, to his credit, said, you know, our relationship needs to change. It's obvious you don't love the house. If you did, it would, it would be evident in, in your giving, and, and he let him go. And I applaud him, you know, for doing that. My dad passed away two weeks ago. He went to heaven. You know what he took with him? Nothing. Nothing. The only thing he took with him was his character, who he was, and the people that he's touched for Christ, those that he's, he's touched through his prayers, through his testimony, through his giving. But that's it. Nothing else. That he take with him. He left everything behind. Everything. Friend, life is short. I want to enter eternity and hear it well done. Now, you know, I'm going to tell you something. I would never have told you this when my dad was still living. But he's not here, so he can't get mad at me. <laughs> but, you know, he uh, bought a small piece of property a long time ago and built a small office building where he had his practice for many years. And after he retired, he sold that 
office building that he had built, and he made quite a bit of money on it. He and my mom put every nickel of that into God's kingdom. They didn't take a penny of it. And it would have helped them for their future. They put every nickel of it into the kingdom. And you know what? Because of that, and because of his consistent giving, though he's dead, it still speaks. Just like Abel's gift, though he's dead, it still, still speaks. Now, if as you consider these three tests, your speech, how you treat others, or your giving, you realize there's a, a real chasm between you and God. The way to make it right is not to just, you know, bustle about and try and change those outward behaviors. Though changing the outward things is important, but we must realize the root is spiritual. The root of things is internal. Those three things we talked about, those are just outward symptoms. The real way, you know, to get it changed is to repent and to come to God, to draw nigh to Him so that He can deal with the root. If you've lost your fire, if you've lost your passion, then draw near to God and He will draw near to you. Thank you for joining us for today's broadcast. Whether you watch this on television, through a podcast, or through some other means, we're just very, very glad that you joined us. Do you know, I'd like you to consider doing something. If you wouldn't mind letting us know how the message has impacted your life, if there was something that, that stood out to you or if it helped you in some way, let us know because it would encourage the people on the team here and would help us do a better job at what we're doing. We look forward to hearing from you. We hope you enjoyed today's message. Order the full version of this teaching on CD, DVD, or MP3 by using the contact details on screen now. Our prayer for you is that you'll continually grow in the wisdom, faith, and power that comes when we hear and apply God's word in our daily lives. Hi there. I've written a little booklet about the cross, something I believe can benefit every believer. We're looking at whether it's a reason for offense or if it's actually God's loving open door to a lost and hurting world. And along with that, I preached several messages in our church recently. These can help equip you to confidently share your faith with the lost. If you're serious about sharing your faith with others, Contact us today to receive the Cross Bundle. This booklet and two message series will equip you to confidently talk about the most important decision you made in your life and the joy you found in Jesus. Learn how you can engage the lost so they can cross over from death to life. Request your Cross Bundle today when you use the contact information on the screen.